So hi everyone, uh, my name is Zuza Varso. I'm one of the co-directors at Open Future. We're a digital policy think tank based in Amsterdam and in Warsaw. I'm based in Warsaw. We have a small team uh, spread across Europe. Um, and we focus on issues around openness on the internet and off the internet. And in particular, what I care about and, and what, I, what my work focuses on is um, trying to envision digital infrastructures, so computational technologies that are, not, um, um, that are not in the hands of a couple of big tech that, um, that extract value from the, users, from, the, from the users' attention, from the comments, and, and destroy our democracies and the environment while doing so. So instead, we try to come up with alternative uh, ways of organizing these um, digital infrastructures that would actually serve public interest, uh, that would serve our democracies and, and, and serve the users, and with what is important, be available to lay people, right? So people without technical knowledge, so people like my mom who can't uh, go on Fediverse and, and use it to, to discuss things with, their, with her friends, but who has to use Facebook for that. Um, okay, so um, the title of my presentation today is The Paradox of Open, Can Digital Commons Offer a Way Forward? And I will start by explaining what we at Open Future mean when we say the paradox of open. One important disclaimer is that um, I'm a human rights lawyer, I'm not a technologist, so bear with me. Um, hopefully my, my perspective will complement uh, your own experience and, and then we can have interesting discussions. So. So yes, paradox of open. Uh, in order to, to tell you what we mean by that, we need to begin at the beginning, um, but don't worry, so it's not just gonna be about reminiscing. So, um, and, and begin, beginning at the beginning means um, going back to the turn of the 20th century where the, um, when the internet gave birth to the open movement and, and digital commons, so these collectively created and governed, um, governed, maintained resources that were available to the public. So uh, proponents of openness uh, placed their bets on, on the combined power of uh, network information services and then these new modes of, of sharing, of creating and sharing. And um, this, was, this was the promise, right? This was the promise and it was very aptly, um, aptly described and analyzed by, by this guy, so Yokai Benkler, um, who in his uh, Wealth of Networks, uh, he took basically, he took hold of the capitalism's two dearest concepts, so wealth and freedom, and he gave them a new economic spin, a new economic second life. So uh, Benkler, uh, Benkler proposed this new, uh, so he hoped that these concepts would uh, allow a new economic model, a new economic paradigm based on uh, peer production to, to occur. And, and he presented a very compelling and very uh, also hopeful uh, model for the future. But for some reason, the open revolution did not happen, at least not to the extent that the proponents of openness, um, of all things open, um, hoped for and anticipated. And this is, this is definitely not to say that these concepts uh, did not prove viable. They absolutely did. And, and this conference is one of the best examples of that. Um, and we have other examples as well. But, um, but over the last decade or so, the digital environment has, um, has undergone a profound change. And the way, the way it is being experienced by people on an uh, everyday basis is, 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 is far from these initial ideals. Um, so what is the... Uh, okay, so this is, this is a good quote that, will, that I will come back to later in this presentation because it, it, uh, it somehow backfired. Uh, um, but basically, Benkler said that it is the freedom to interact with resources and projects without seeking anyone's permission that marks common-based production generally. So that was the that was the idea. That was the that was the initial uh, initial thought, initial um, approach behind openness. But now we come to reality. So. Um, 
so now we are in a situation where uh, where this early optimism uh, and early opti early optimism and early idealism gave way to uh, to um, to reality, as I said, at which a handful of companies of corporations uh, exercise a disproportionate control over the digital environment. And um, I have said that these early ideals have given way, but, um, but one could go a step further and say that they, that they somehow enabled this, this concentration of power, these new concentrations of power that, that arose. And this is exactly what my colleagues, uh, Paul Keller and Alek Tarkovsky, called the paradox of open. So the situation which the open, on the one hand, challenges uh, certain concentrations of power, and it absolutely did, but, uh, but at the same time, it, it gave rise to this new, new, to, to new types of concentration of power. So the paradox of open is about this tension between the promise and the, and the reality that we got. So you're, you're well aware of that, um, that the corporations uh, working for their own benefit, that they took over, that strategy is the language of the open movement. Um, they, uh, they started using these mechanisms and they started building atop the, the, the work that, that has been done by the open movement. And um, basically what happened is that um, the open movement did not fully account for the power structures within which it would operate. Uh, it, it posed certain, certain problems, but then it did not, did not uh, really, um, in time, become aware of, of new ones arising. And this, is, um, this, is, this was recently very nicely um, summarized, I think, by Louis Villa, who's an American uh, attorney and a programmer, and in those discussions about openness and what happened to the open, he said, well, open is not a magic bullet to the heart of power. And this is, again, not to, not to give up on openness, uh, far from it, but uh, more and more scholars, more and more uh, activists are realizing that open on its own will not, uh, will not, solve, uh, will not solve the problem. Right? Um, last year, there was this paper that you might be familiar with called Open for Business, where people, where, where a couple of scholars also looked into how open in the in the field of uh, AI in particular is being is being used, and um, and before I move on to these to, to a couple of instances of of uh, the paradox of open, in order then to build on this uh, a, a viable way forward, let me spend a minute talking about open washing. So. I know that I think last year there was a there was a there was a talk about open source AI and what that means, and open washing is this is a phenomenon that in the field of open source or open AI uh, manifests itself uh, a lot, and um, so here you can you can see an excerpt from from uh, from uh, New York Times where, where they actually picked up on this on this phenomenon and and, and explain what it means. But um, let me give you a two, two examples of, of, um, of what we've been doing in our work when it comes to open washing. So for example, um, and you, you're probably aware of the, the, the process that is currently running, run by Open Source Initiative, who is implementing this co-design um, process to define what open source AI uh, is supposed to stand for and what it's supposed to entail. So there are different versions of the definition being discussed um, on, on, on different fora. Uh, they, they organize calls so people can chip in and comment. But in the meantime, while the definition is being, is being uh, finalized, uh, developers, companies, corporations have already started using this term, open source AI. And for example, uh, Lama 2, this is, this is one of the examples that we looked at, um, has been presented and has been described as open source AI, but when you actually look at the license, look at the conditions of the license, you see that there's non-competitive clauses there. So which goes against the, the, the assumptions behind what open source um, is, supposed to, is supposed to indicate, and, and it also, uh, well, does not allow the freedoms that open source uh, is, is, uh, is to allow. And another interesting example of, of open washing is, is the, one of the Falcon models, uh, and there, 
mm, the license actually uh, limited what the cloud service providers could do with the model. So although it was presented as open source, it required uh, cloud service providers to seek a separate license with the provider uh, for running the model, uh, which points to this, uh, to this um, well, very important bottleneck in this whole open source AI ecosystem, which is access to compute. And, uh, and also is, is, in our opinion, an instance of, uh, of open washing because these limitations of what can be done with the, with the model are, are against the, 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 the assumptions behind open source. So actually, this, 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 the fact that this case of Falcon is, is a really important one because it also points to some of the early criticisms that Bankler um, received uh, basically, that he, he, in his work, in his vision, kind of disregarded the physical layer of the of the internet. That he assumed that that um, that this information is free and it's going to be free and it's going to be shared and, and 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 produced, but did not really pay so much attention to where this information actually lives. And um, so. It, it, it seems very basic right now, but, uh, but although, as I said, information wants to be free, it, it has to live somewhere, right, to put it in a very naive terms. And, and that place, that space, and the energy that, that, that this, uh, this, this uh, hardware is running on is, a, is an economic good, and, and it's very often a scarce economic good. So, this is one of the this is one of the one of the critiques that 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 I will come come back to and one of the important um, important conditions to keep in mind if we want to have a viable uh, a viable future where these technologies are governed differently. But um, so so compute is one of those bottlenecks, and then the, the other bottleneck is is data. And I want to focus a little bit on on a couple of instances of what we call the paradox of open. So the first, um, the first, uh, the first case is, is somewhat historical, but I think it, it, it still is very relevant be, because although it's from a couple of years ago, it, uh, it provided important lessons that we are learning the hard way right now, we or the, the society in general. So. So um, this case concerned the, concerned the use of openly licensed photos to train AI facial recognition algorithm. And it was prompted by, and our interest was prompted by, 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 by this very fact that um, by 2014, there were over 400 million CC, so Creative Commons licensed photos on Flickr. And then uh, one fourth of those pictures was, were, was taken by a bunch of different uh, researchers from different labs. And, um, and, and they created one of the most popular data set for computer vision applications. And as part of the project that we did on this, we conducted a survey to gather um, insights from the platform users. So we asked them uh, how they feel when they learn that their images, uh, or rather, which is important, images that they uploaded, because these were often not their images, these were images of other people, um, so how did they feel about these pictures being used to train facial recognition, which then was often used in, in law enforcement context or in military context. So, so participants expressed their, um, their feelings and emotions um, based on the scale of eight primary emotions developed by Robert Plutchik. And these basic uh, eight emotions are joy, trust, fear, anger, sadness, surprise, anticipation, and disgust. And I don't know uh, if you can, uh, if the, the, the graph is clear and you can read the results, but um, the dominant responses were fear, disgust, sadness, surprise, and anger. So not the most positive ones. Mm. And this keeps coming back, this um, these, uh, enormous sense of, of violation that people express when they learn what, what is happening to their, to their content, to their data being, being used by, in ways that they did not anticipate. And one could say, of course, that, well, they should have anticipated that. Uh, but um, but uh, uh, even, even, even if those uses did not violate law, they definitely violated some community norms and so social norms. So, 
Actually, in a follow-up workshop that we organized on, on this case, uh, one, of the, one of the participants asked, uh, well, who dropped the ball, right? What, how, how could it happen? And, and the answer was, everyone did. Um, and this is not to say that you know, everyone is to blame, but there were so many layers of, of, this, of this situation. So one could say that the users dropped the balls because they, well, they should have anticipated that their content might be scraped and then used. Often not their pictures, but pictures of other people that they photographed, so and they rarely asked for consent. One can say that the platform did not do a good job, did not say, secure their users from these kind of um, violations. Then the researchers, right, the researchers relied on copyright, did not consider the privacy implications of what they're doing at all. They, uh, they assumed if the content is CC licensed, then it can be, then it can be used in, in, uh, in any way they, they want. And, and finally, maybe the developers, right? The developers that worked on this, on this um, AI without much thinking about uh, the, con the, the, the situations and the, and the context, context in which it might be used. And of course, this is a whole other discussion to what extent the developers are responsible to, for what, what their, how their work is used for. But, um, but in any case, this, 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 this Flickr um, situation points to a couple of important lessons, right? So it points to the tension between openness and, and privacy concerns and, um, and data protection concerns, particularly in the age of AI. It also points to the limit of, limits of copyright. Um, and here is a quote from uh, Creative Commons um, re referring to this case where, where, where Creative Commons says that CC licenses were designed to address a specific constraint, which they do very well, right? Unlocking restrictive copyright. But copyright is not a good tool to protect individual privacy, to address research ethics in AI development, or to regulate the use of surveillance tools employed online. So basically, they're say, saying this is not a copyright issue. And indeed, it might not be a copyright issue, but, um, but this, more, this broader context, I think, needs to be considered. Um, some, of the, some of the other lessons are about the unexpected uses of content that is put online, and then also it's a classic example um, of, of the extraction of value of the, of the digital commons. And the, this, the second example I want to share with you, the second manifestation of the paradox of open is, of course, generative AI. And this is a topic that dominates so many discussions we're having right now in, 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 in Brussels with policymakers, but also with the open movement who have to, who have to ha somehow grapple with the, with the new reality and, and come up with, with new norms. And... Um, and here, when I say, when I'm referring to digital commons, it's, it's in this very general, very, very broad sense. So not only CC license, uh, license content or, uh, or open source uh, content, but rather this uh, sum total of, of human creation and human knowledge that exists online uh, and can be scraped. So the, the rise of the generative AI uh, caught uh, many people by surprise especially those outside of the, of the um, industry. And it has, it's, it, it has sparked a very, very, um, very heated debate among people, among um, I mean, copyright holders, um, digital rights activists, and, and uh, cre uh, creators, but also, of course, people who want to use this content to, 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 to do AI. And, uh, and, and again, there's this, uh, there's this sense of violation and, and lack of recourse when people simply oppose uh, the, 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 their creation being used and confined in models that are actually created in a way that is supposed to compete with them. Um, so so this, 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 the, the, there's this sense of, of injustice there. Um, of, of, um, of their work being used in a way that, that then might basically take their livelihood away uh, in some cases. So, uh, so um, there, were, there, there are some, strong, some strong, strong words being used in this context and, and see, for example, this, this quote from an open letter uh, that was published back in 2023 uh, by, by creators. 
which uh, which uh, basically refers to what is what has uh, what has been happening as a daylight robbery, right? So um, harvesting images and uh, and and the content without creators' knowledge. Uh, let alone compensation or consent, right? These are the, co the two key elements. So there was, there's no consent, there's no con compensation. And again, what, the, the jury is still out to decide whether this is legal or not. Uh, in Europe, we have a pretty well-defined legal framework for, for, uh, for this. Uh, we have the copyright directive, we have text and data mining rules, we have the rules ar around opt-out in the US, it's, it's different. But, uh, but again, even if this turns out to be legal, there's this sense of violation of, of some social and community norms. And the final, the final example I want to I wanna refer to um, uh, has to do with, with um, platforms, with social media platforms, but also platforms more, platforms more generally. And, um, and again, from, for a layperson, for, uh, for everyday user, Platforms, social media platforms, is how they experience, uh, how they is their ecosystem. Although that ecosystem, the word ecosystem, raises some concerns, as you see in that in that quote here. So, um, over the last year, this this these platforms have uh, have become very powerful intermediaries, and and they um, they are both uh, new digital marketplaces, and they are all also public squares, right? So people exchange their goods, they exchange ideas, they they discuss, they organize, they coordinate. I remember very well when Russia attacked Ukraine. In Poland, there was this uh, up, uh, there was this wave of people organizing help, taking in refugees, organizing help, and the only place they, they could do that was Facebook, and that was uh, <laughs> kind of enraging. But also, that was the reality. That was the only viable option people had to self-organize, to go on Facebook and and and, and talk to each other there. So, in this absence of public alternatives. Uh, we as users, but also public institutions um, such as libraries, school, universities, uh, get, um, get, get locked in, are dependent on these commercial services. And in a way, they do fulfill the, the function of public spaces, but they're not. They're definitely not public spaces. They are uh, engineered, uh, engineered online shopping malls. Um, like, um, so this is online shopping malls. This is a reference to this book, uh, Internet F for the People, by P Ben Tarnoff, highly recommended, where he uh, very well describes the, the politics around, around these. So, um, so in, these, in these online shopping malls, um, people are under constant private surveillance, and by now this is, everybody knows that, that their data is used to uh, not only to improve the user experience or, uh, or services, but it's also turned into these prediction tools that are then sold to the, to the advertisers. Uh, so this is common knowledge by now. Hopefully, uh, this is a pri prime example of what Shoshana Zubov called surveillance capitalism. Uh, but recently, we've seen a very, uh, another ugly development in the, in the, um, in the sur surveillance capitalism, in the model of, of uh, in this business model, because Meta uh, recently announced that they would, um, that there's a change in their privacy policy, and on a, t on a closer look, it basically boils down to, uh, to them saying that from now on, they will be able to retroactively use their users' data to train, uh, at the moment, unspecified AI technologies. So, rather than seeking consent, rather than seeking opt-in, they assumed that people, well, by accepting terms of use, um, signed up for this kind of uses. And and of course, there's a, there's, a, there's a way of opting out, but the form is quite complicated. There's a, um, there's a, there's a couple of hoops that people need to go, uh, go through. So, um, so I think this is, this is yet another prime example of, of not giving actually people a proper choice uh, in, in light of, these, of the lack of this public alternative. So 
What has been the response to all of this? Um, so first, the response came from civil society and the open movement who pushed back against these trends, who demanded more accountability, more transparency, who, who tried to uh, take care of these limited spaces where the, where, the, uh, where the model worked differently. But, uh, but for a long time, uh, big tech flew under the radar of the regulators, both in, in, um, in Europe and in the US, on the pretense that um, regulating would stifle innovation. And, and um, there were some developments, uh, mostly concerned with protecting privacy and, and, and our personal data, because this this was uh, very clear there, the interference and the violation was very clear, but all these other matters related to um, market dominance, power concentration, and the corrosive effect it had on our economy, democracy, etc., uh, were, not, were not very well uh, recognized. But at some point, this became clear, this became impossible to ignore, um, and uh, over the last couple of years, we've witnessed this uh, in Brussels, in, in, in the European Union, we've seen this regu regulatory rush, right? We have all these um, different acts being adopted, so Digital Markets Act, the Digital Services Act, most recently AI Act, and these are, these are aimed at addressing the different, the different uh, problems uh, of, the, of the digital, uh, digital ecosystems, digital markets right now. And of course, um, the devil is in the detail, and, and when it comes to regulation, the devil is in the implementation, right? Because it's very, very nice to adopt these, these new laws where you recognize the problem, but then implementing them is a whole other story. And again, this is, this is not the subject of this talk, but there are some concerns about, for example, a lot of power being de de delegated to uh, standard-setting organizations that, in fact, are not always run in the most democratic manner. But anyway, this is not, this is not for today. But so we, we've seen this wave of regulation being adopted in Europe, but more and more people are saying that uh, regulation is not enough. Uh, and here you, can, you, you see a quote from uh, Christina Cafara, who's, a, who's an economist and also antitrust lawyer who points out that in Europe, most of the policy oxygen has been sucked up by, um, by, the, by this project of taming large uh, digital platforms through regulation. And while we definitely need this regulation, we also, uh, we also need more than that. And Europe is at an inflection point, not only because we, oh, we, just, had, we just had elections, uh, European elections, but also we have this perspective of the new European Commission being formed in the fall of 2024, so later this year, after the summer break. And, um, and there's this growing awareness that business as usual is not the way to go, and, and that business as usual has actually led us astray in many ways. So... Um, more and more people in Brussels are admitting that this hands-off approach to regulating big tech, this, this being um, passive spectators, uh, cannot, cannot be continued. And um, so, what's the, so what's, the, what's the outlook on the future? Uh, well, when, if we say that regulation is not enough, uh, then, then the next step, so by saying A, we have to say B, so what, what, what else could be done? And there's a growing recognition that in addition to regulation, there's a need for big investments in digital infrastructure because people are realizing that whoever controls infrastructure deter determines the future. And um, so with that in mind, the um, public digital infrastructure and industrial policy are nowadays the terms du jour in Brussels. And um, let, me, let me say a couple of words about this concept of uh, infrastructure, which came up at the beginning when I pointed out that Ben Clare kind of disregarded this material aspect of, of, um, of, digital, of digital commons. Um, so this, this materiality, tangibility, or non-tangibility of infrastructure is important to keep in mind. So 
With infrastructure, I, I, I want to point out two important trends or phenomena. So first is that while, although initially the term, when it was used in the 19th century by, uh, by French architects, um, it referred to physical, tangible structures, so basically roads, waterways, etc. And then when it was used in um, 1927, I think, in the US, it also described this network of tangible physical, physical uh, goods. But with time, uh, the, the, the meaning of, of what, we, what, we, what we think when we say infrastructure changed, and, and infrastructure began, began to describe this also non-tangible non -tangible systems, such as law or education. And basically it reflected also the, the growing role that knowledge and information played in, 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 in the economy. So, so infrastructure is no longer only, uh, only supposed to describe the tangible physical layers and structures. It's more, uh, it's more understood as a precondition, as a, as a, um, as a prerequisite of uh, growth and development. So people have described infrastructure as shared means to achieve different aims. And... Um, and and so that's the that's the first that's the first uh, important um, aspect of infrastructure. The other is that traditionally uh, infrastructures were considered public goods, so people were uh, were able to use it uh, without really asking for consent. And the fact that for consent of the of the of the provider of the infrastructure. Uh, so, in other words, they were uh, non-exclusive, non-excludable. That these these are related, but somewhat different 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 terms. But they are basically uh, both describing the the fact that it's that many people can use it at the same time, and it's difficult to to prohibit people from using it. And um, and also, there's few incentives for people to contribute to building these infrastructures traditionally. Um, so, so in a way, it's been referred to as a market failure, and this, uh, this explained why there was a role for the state to step in and to, to address this market, market failure. So, um, but the landscape of the, on, of the infrastructure has changed, um, and the neoliberal um, turn has led to growing privatization of infrastructure, and also the financialization of markets also led to the change in how, um, how infrastructure is, is financed and, and, and is, and is um, built. So how, what does it, what, what all of this has, have to do with digital infrastructure? Well, we see both, both trends in, in what we mean by digital infrastructure as well. So on the one hand, we see that infrastructure, so these shared means to achieve different aims, is no longer only about cables and hardware and all of that. We are well aware of that data, software, data spaces are also important preconditions, are also prerequisites uh, for people to be able to, to develop and, and grow. And then the other, the other trend, that of privatization, of fragmentation, has also, uh, ha has also taken place uh, in the case of, pub of digital infrastructure. So historically, governments played a huge role in, in building these foundational uh, technologies, including the internet, but then uh, it became uh, privatized, fragmented, and the digital services built atop of these physical infrastructures then was mostly in, left within this neoliberal paradigm was, were, was left to market forces. Not all of it, but mostly predominantly to market forces. And this led to this rapid accumulation of wealth and, and, um, and, it, and it gave rise basically to some of the highly, okay, five minutes, great, uh, valued companies in the history of, 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 of our economy. So, um, 
So all all of this, uh, all of these, all of these trends and 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 the awareness of the again of the corrosive effect it had on our on our economy, these business models, but also on our democracy, and be, and to be frank, also of, on our mental health, has led to this resurgent interest in public digital infrastructure. So there's a, there's talk about uh, digital sovereignty in Europe, right? Dependencies uh, on on American technologies. So again. Um, uh, again, we we are experiencing a sort of a new uh, a new uh, um, a new paradigm um, arising. So, um, in terms of what can be done with all of all of this, um, there's growing awareness about the need to invest in in public digital infrastructure, which has its own risk because there's this. Um, there's the, there, there are ideas expressed by some politicians in Europe that in order to address the, the monopolies, in order to ad address the bottlenecks, we need to build our own champions, right? So in, in, in a way, we need to fi fight fire with fire. But this doesn't, does not seem like such a great idea, creating new bottlenecks to address the existing bottlenecks. So there's a there's a there's a heated discussion about what should happen uh, at this at this level where certain economies of scale are inevitable but there are there are there are strategies that uh, antitrust anti monopoly um, knows to to deal with that and then when it comes to this upper so to say upper layer of the of the, uh, uh, the um, of the infrastructure so these intangible this non physical uh, this non physical um, services, there's a growing interest in digital commons as providers of public digital um, infrastructure. So at Open Future, we've been working on, on ways uh, how this could be operationalized, so how this could be um, implemented by and together with the open movement. So, but before I move on to, to, to telling you very briefly, because I'm running out of time, about a couple of uh, examples of, of, of what we've been doing, um, let me just uh, uh, highlight that one of our main asks and one of our main demands is, is for the creation of what we call European uh, Public Digital Infrastructure Fund. So this, um, this recognition that without proper funding, this will not fly. And, and the funding should not be only for uh, so-called innovation, but it should also be for uh, maintenance of the, of the existing services, because some of them are, are uh, really not doing that well. Um, so, so this is one of so this is the underlying uh, underlying ask. Of course, this funding should should um, have some conditionalities to ensure that it feeds back to the commons, and it's not and it's not exploited. But other than that. Um, some of our work is around trying to make AI work for creators and the commons. So, uh, together with different partners, and all of this is rooted in the, in the hard lessons that we've learned from the par paradox of open that I, that I was telling you about earlier. So, with a, with a group of organizations, we formulated this set of principles that should, um, in our opinion, that could, in our opinion, help uh, in addressing some of the, some of the challenges AI uh, raises for creators and the commons. So we, we, we have this uh, set of rules, principles, and then um, we run alignment assembly, which is uh, like a participatory process uh, uh, over six weeks, to, uh, where people can comment on, these, on this principle, can add uh, new principles, and, uh, and basically align around what they have in common. And actually, very soon, we're launching a report based on this activity, based on this inquiry. And, and of course, you are all uh, welcome to join. Um, the other, the other uh, inquiry, the other activity that we've been undertaking uh, is about um, commons-based data set governance for AI. So recognizing that, uh, that Openness is not only like co complete openness when it comes to data and data set for AI is not all, always a viable option. We, uh, we again tried to design like a blueprint for governing these, these data, data sets in a way that on the one hand uh, stays, stays true to this 
original um, idea and vision of sharing as much as possible, but at the same time recognizes the, the challenges it, it gives, uh, it raises in terms of, uh, for example, privacy um, and, and choices of data subjects. And, um, and let me finish off by, by, by asking a very, a very uh, proper question, which might rise, ra be raised in your, hand, uh, in your heads. Uh, so why would it be different this time, right? The digital commons is not a new concept. We've known this for, for, for a while now. So why do we hope that uh, digital commons might, uh, might be a viable option of moving forward? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Let me just name, name a couple. So first of all, we are wiser. We know about the paradox of open. We know that there are power structures that we need to take into, into consideration when we, when we uh, do things um, in the open. Then the zeitgeist is more favorable. Some of the, some of the ideas that um, a couple of years ago seemed very radical, very progressive, uh, these days are more and more well, well, maybe not welcome, but, but tolerated in some circles in, 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 in Brussels. So this neoliberal paradigm of, of um, economic paradigm is, not on, is, is finally uh, it's being recognized that this is, might not be the, the only viable option. The other reason is that the state, the governments, are acknowledging the role of the digital commons and, and the role that they might play in, in trying to come up with this, again, like an alternative to market-run or, or state-run um, governance model, which, of course, comes with its, with its own risk. Some people say that if the, if the state is, interferes with digital commons too much, it will actually lead uh, to a downfall. Of, of, of the digital commons. But um, I think, uh, again, this is impor it's important that there is this recognition for digital commons and, and there is support for, uh, for maintenance because otherwise it will, it will be difficult to, to move forward. And finally, um, the regulation that I referred to, uh, although not, again, not a magic bullet uh, on its own, uh, is important because it creates this, uh, it gives uh, more breathing space to alternative models to, to develop and to actually exist and to maybe flourish at, at, at some point. So on this, I will finish. Thank you very much. Um, uh, let, me, let me open the floor to your questions, but I'm also interested in your, uh, in your comments, in your takes, in all of this. Uh, so if you want to keep up to date, I encourage you to subscribe to, to our newsletter. Uh, you can find it at openfuture.eu. You have to scroll to the bottom, and there it is. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions? You have questions, yeah. Thank you so much. This was, this was amazing. This was great. Um, you've talked a lot about uh, developing open infrastructure, and, uh, but there's something that you said that I've been wondering about for a very long time, which is about um, actually uh, not only regulating, but even getting to the point of um, even forbidding some things from happening. So the United States is now openly considering banning TikTok, the Chinese social network. Is there any possibility in the following years that the European Union will get to this point with some of the American services, or is this uh, a bit of a very far-fetched idea for now? Mm. That's a, such an important point. Um, it's hard to say because with the uh, with the new Commission uh, coming being formed um, later this year, we don't know yet what will be on their in their work program. But I think um, there's definitely growing awareness um, about the dependencies and the risks this entails for, uh, for our public institutions. Um, you know, I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I speak with those, with those people, we have this conversation about public digital infrastructure, about alternatives, and then when, I, when we have a meeting, they send me an invite on Teams, right? So I'm like, okay. 
there's something wrong there, right? If we cannot come up with our own alternatives, viable options, I'm not saying that Teams is horrible or anything, but you know, there's this, there's this, it's so deeply rooted in the institution, in our universities, in our schools. Uh, so, so I think recognizing these dependencies is one thing, and then banning certain things uh, I think this is not impossible right now. There's really like a, a, a wave of very, very motivated um, policymakers in, in Brussels that are, I think, more willing to, de to take these bold uh, moves. But, you know, there, there's always a question whether, whether banning something is, is, is the way to go. I think people will find a, a way around. So, so um, I think without... So my... my so my, my roots are in the, in the digital rights uh, movement, and we've always been the ones pushing back against the bad stuff. But the more, the more I work on this, uh, the more I realize that, that without, public, without viable alternatives, there's no, there's no, there's no escape. Thank you for your talk. Uh, first of all, let me say I'm not speaking for my employer, um, cool. whom I will not mention. Um, <laughs> So, I love the ideas. They, they, in the abstract, all of these words sound wonderful, open, uh, control of privacy, and so on, but I'm not sure how they translate into concrete reality. For example, uh, let's say that Facebook says that Google is not allowed to index their content, which in fact they did do some years ago. Is that pro-open or anti-open? Because they're prohibiting the public access to their content, through a third party. They're saying, oh, you can only come through Facebook to see Facebook content. Is that okay? Maybe that's okay. What if the Hungarian government says, mm. this section of the penal code is a secret law which you are not allowed to index and show on your search engine? Is that open or not open? Are they protecting their own data or are they prohibiting other people from learning about perhaps some very bad law? Um, it, 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 the, the words sound wonderful but I don't see how they translate into reality. Well, the examples you gave are, are good ones, and they also point to the, some of the new ones. And I think um, we should have different expectation towards private entities and towards governments. So this will be uh, one point, right? When we, um, and of course this, this is not so easy because, so traditionally, uh, traditionally, private entities were allowed to do basically whatever they want as long as they don't violate our rights, right? And the governments were always only allowed to do what is written in the law. So there has to be some legal basis for what they're doing. With time and with the big corporations gaining more and more power, there was this recognition that they are in fact uh, sometimes more powerful than the, than the governments and what they do about, for example, freedom of speech has more impact on our experiencing of freedom of speech than the government. So this, this became uh, more fuzzy. But um, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't have the, I don't have the answer. You, could, you, 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 you always have to, you know, the lawyer in me says it depends, right? It depends. It has to be proportionate. What are, the, what are, what are, they, trying to, what are they trying to protect? What are they really trying to protect? No, not what are they saying they're protecting, right? And, and, and then non, no, few, very few principles that govern our uh, society are absolute. Most of the principles that govern rules and human rights can be limited and to some extent. Well, we cannot limit the prohibition of torture, but mostly, most of the other stuff can be limited, right? So if there are good grounds to limit freedom of speech or freedom of information, it should be allowed, but the gr grounds need to be really strong. Uh, thank you very much, Susa. Thank you. <laughs>